this morning. So everyone welcome Pastor Amanda to the stage. Amen. Thank you. Well, before I get going, I, I, um, I just want to say good morning. Is it well with you? Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? I like to see all your friendly faces. Is this weather not just amazing? Yeah. I was at the grocery store yesterday, and the, the man who I was trying to find Cumberland sausages, and he was assisting me, and he decided to have a little conversation in the middle of his assistance. And he said to who I'm getting ready to introduce, he said, well, we love the weather today, but give us three days, and we're going to want it to be cooler. And I thought, this is so true. You know yourself well. You know yourself well, but I'm enjoying it. I have the privilege of really, yes, if, yes, thank you, all the Ignite, if you're seeing them go out, they are, they know where to go, they're like, forget, forget y'all, I know where to go, <laughs> we're excited that they have an opportunity, there are 10 to 13 year olds, and they, uh, they leave during this time, I have really been privileged over my life, my dad said something years ago that I repeat so often, he said, big doors swing on small hinges, and he used that as an example to say that every big door that comes to your life, Amanda, comes and swings through a relationship that probably was unexpected. And many, many years ago, I was sitting in Oklahoma City. We had only been there for a couple of years. And Bishop Miller, my dad, had received a, um, an invitation to go to Singapore to preach. He had contacts there with the Assemblies of God. And one of the largest churches in that area was hosting a conference, and they invited him to come. And as a result of that, the year later, we invited uh, those that were part of that congregation and leadership to join us. And is, as a result, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Lori Vervak. And Lori and I have become chums, friends, pals, as well as she's played a pivotal role in some of the places I've been able to go. Um, she opened Argentina to me. That was the first person who allowed me to go to Argentina to preach was because of her. She was part of the team that I was on when we went to Colombia uh, in serving in various nations in South America. And I've really been so thankful that I didn't ignore the small hinge. Okay. Y'all, some of y'all going to get that like at lunch. I wanted to be sure to steward relationships, and I'm thankful that this month, Dr. Lori Vervek has said, I'm coming to visit you. I don't need anything from you, but I'm coming around, and I just want to spend some time together, and we have are so blessed. I told her, I said, that's really wonderful. I think that's great that you want to come and do nothing, but that's not a thing for me. So you're going to do something. There's definitely a something you're going to do. So I wanted Lori to greet you today. So Dr. Lori, would you come? She's an incredible woman of God. She speaks all over the world. And uh, I want her to say hello. Oh, yes, I can come. Yes, I can come down. Correct. I don't even know what Lori's doing. She just told me she had a bag today. So, and it's from TJ Maxx. I know here it's called TK Maxx, right? Yeah. <laughs> For all the TK Maxx lovers out yeah. there. Woo we love TK Maxx. Yes. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to bring you greetings. Um, I currently live in the state of Utah, home of the Mormons. So I live on a mission field. Yeah. But, uh, and it's very hot right now. So I told Pastor Amanda and Pastor Jason that I brought the warm weather with me. And maybe when I leave in, in about 10 days, I'll take the warm weather back. <laughs> <It> could be. <laughs> no, I'll leave it here with you so you can enjoy it also. But I've, I've known that I was coming to be with you since February. And I've been asking God, what do I bring with me? as a part, as a gift for Mosaic Church. I'm, I am a very prophetic person, and so I ask God, what do I bring? Of course, I know your name, Mosaic, and I know all the meaning behind that name, that word. So I wanted to bring something that was probably tied into it, but yet different, right? And so what you were just talking about with Doors, I think you're going to be very interested in what is in this bag. <laughs> I want you to know that Mosaic Church is not new to me. I watched many of your services when you were online. 
so you didn't know that I was a part of your congregation, but because of relationship and knowing that Pastor Amanda and Pastor Jason and their family would be coming to England, I wanted to be connected because relationships are key. So I know you, Mosaic Church, and now you're getting to know me just a little bit. But Pastor Amanda, if you'll open, take out. Okay. Turn it around so you can see. And what does it say? <laughs> doors to the world. Puzzle doors to the world. So this is a jigsaw puzzle, but it's a very unique puzzle. And you know, when the Holy Spirit is involved in something, he prepares the way even before you start, right? So even with the songs that you sang this morning, talked about Jesus being the cornerstone. When you put a jigsaw puzzle together, where do you start? With the corners. And then you build the borders, right? Yeah. And then you began to sing about, Pastor Amanda, you were talking about being ambushed. And so God puts before us doors of opportunities. And you have to open the door. So a door may be before you, and it could remain closed. So my word today for Mosaic Church is that God is giving you doors, but not just doors for England. Amen. These are doors from around the world. And I'm always fascinated as I travel of windows and doors. Because when you look at windows and doors in, in various countries, they all have a unique shape and design. And with those doors also come very unique locks and keys. Keys that are used in some countries are not the same that are used in other countries. So to unlock doors of opportunities, each one of us have to have the right keys and know which doors we are to walk through. But this jigsaw puzzle is not just ordinary shapes. Each of the shapes in this puzzle could be a bird, could be a dog, could be a car, could be anything because it's shapes and each one of you are unique. And without your presence, you cannot make up Mosaic Church. So your uniqueness is needed to put this puzzle together. So my challenge to you is for this church to put this puzzle together. Amen. So maybe you'll set it on a table. And as each of you come in, you can take a piece and put it together. And together then you will see doors of opportunities for the world. So you are just beginning. So I bought this puzzle back in February, even before you were going to open the manor and welcome the, the Ukrainians into this home. The doors of opportunities that if you will have ears to hear and eyes to see, your future is before you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Lori. Thank you receive that. Come on, why don't you give it up one more time for Dr. Lori, let her know. Isn't it good to have prophetic insights? You know what? You know, there is something about that for me. Now, Lori and I don't talk about everything because I tend to be quite private, actually. People don't know that about me, but you doubt do. Do you know why I don't tell everything? Because sometimes I need a word from God. And if somebody knows everything, they try to sometimes say what you want to hear what, than what you need to hear. You know, Pastor Gary will understand that. Of course, that's not true of Lord, but it's true of others. So I've just developed this keen sense and awareness to not always dump everything that's happening. But last week, in the meetings that I had on the behalf of this congregation, I met with over seven different nations. Seven nations. Now, maybe that's not, okay, well, maybe that wasn't a big deal to you. That's a big deal to me because I believe that we're called to be a global church. 
I do not believe we're called to just serve Coventry. We're called to be a epicenter in Coventry that serves the world. There's a difference. If you believe everything revolves around the little space that you're in, then all you'll ever reach is the little space you're in. But if you believe that God uses you as an example so that he can enlarge you and take you to a different space, then that's what God wants to do with us. So it doesn't mean that we have to pick up and move to a different country like I did, but it does mean that we have to be ready and willing to walk through the doors God gives us. So men, what a powerful word. Are you ready to receive the word of the Lord today? I'm gonna move rather quickly because I know uh, I'm a bit behind in scheduling, but I want you to turn to Luke chapter four. Luke chapter four. I wanna talk about a word that we tend to know and hear a lot in Pentecostal church. We just don't know what it means. We say the word anointing a lot. We talk about anointing, we prophesy about anointing, we pray over anointing, we preach over anointing, and yet no one ever explains anointing. So I'm going to take time today to break down what I believe is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know why? I told you at the beginning of the year, the word of the Lord over my life in this year was to take from the ancient and pull it into the present. And so I want us to not be an ignorant generation an ignorant church. We need to know foundational things about the gospel. And the anointing's foundational. I didn't make it up. Pentecostal church movement didn't make it up. It didn't come on the horizon in the 19th century. It's God's mechanism. It's God's way. So if we understand it, then we get to work with what we understand. Isn't that good news? The more you understand something, the more you can use it properly. I can remember being in Africa one time, and I, this is a true story, it was many, many years ago, but I was in a very, very distinct village, and they were delivering TV sets to them, and it was right when, this, when things had changed, and remote controls had come out, universal remote controls. And I will never forget being in this village, and we brought televisions, because they had this unusual access to television, but they didn't have running water. It was the strangest thing. And we brought these televisions to try to connect them actually to biblical teaching. That was the point of it. And we were giving out the TVs and this man came up and he unpacked the TV and he had the remote control and he took it just like this. Now that's not a discredit to him. He had never seen a remote control. So therefore he had no idea how to use it. We walked over and we said to him, this is how you use this remote control. You point at the TV and when he did, of course, his eyes lit up and he was so excited. That's exactly how the principles of the kingdom work. Many people don't have access to understanding and as a result of it, they try to turn remote controls into cell phones. And you, if you don't know how to use something and work with something, you don't get the benefit of it. So Luke chapter 4, stand with me, starting in verse 18. Sorry, this is a familiar verse of scripture. It goes with our church. If you're new to Mosaic, you may not know that. But this is part of our scripture that God has given to us, starting in verse 18. This is Jesus speaking, red letter. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now this is Jesus. He's given us an incredible amount of detail on why we have the Holy Spirit, why he has the Holy Spirit, what happens when he has the Holy Spirit, and what God requires as a result of that. All in two verses. He just told you basically the entire mandate. But then we look over, and I'm gonna read this to you. Out of 2 Corinthians chapter one, this is now Paul speaking, and he says in verse 21, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed all of us who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So today I wanna to take a minute and I wanna preach on the subject, the anointing is in you. The anointing is in you. 
Lord, thank you for the ability to preach and teach. Thank you, Lord, that you put me on like a coat and wear me, that you'll make my tongue like the pen of a ready writer, that you will open people's eyes through my words because they drip with the honeycomb of heaven. Lord, thank you for ears to be unplugged so people can hear you and hearts to receive. You get all the glory and all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, turn to somebody and tell them the anointing is in you. Now, this is a really important, yes. Do you know what I love is that we tend to say more words than just the ones I say. I'm telling you, I'm going to have to really work on only this part. I'm just kidding. The anointing that rests in you. Here's the thing is that the anointing comes first and foremost from God. It is God's mechanism to us. And you say, well, why does God feel to use a word like anointing separate from just saying Holy Spirit? Because he wants us to understand that there is function inside of the Holy Spirit that forms us and uniquely works with us to bring forth power through us. So this is what I'd like to say and as the starting definition of what it means to be anointed. It means to have presence with power on purpose. It means to have presence with power on purpose. In other words, it's an, actively part, it's an active part of your internal life. The presence of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit for six weeks, so I can't go backwards. But we've been talking about the presence of God automatically getting on the inside of you. And as a result of it getting on the inside of you, there is an empowerment that comes because now that presence known as the Holy Spirit begins to work through you and pull out of you things you had no idea were there. But what we need to learn about the anointing is that the anointing is a specific power. It's not just any type of power. It's a specific power. And most people have only associated the word anointing with five-fold ministry gifts out of Ephesians chapter 4. We would say things like, my pastor is anointed. Now, that's very kind of you to say if you do say those things, but that's not completely the true definition of anointing because there is nothing in what I read in Corinthians that says that anointing belongs to only pastors. Paul was not writing to pastors. Paul was writing to the church, and he was telling them that Jesus came, he walked the planet for you, he left and sent the Holy Ghost, and he sent him because he wanted you to walk in anointing. Now, here's the nice thing about the word anointing. Anointing is an Old Testament word. It's a word we use in the first 39 books. It's a word that we use in symbol and in type. In other words, it is God's description in a picture to help us understand a principle that we live out in the New Testament. So when we use the picture of anointing in the Old Testament, it's to help us understand what God is doing on the inside of us in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the only way you could be anointed is if a prophet came to you and said, you're God's chosen person, and they poured a horn of oil over you, or they would smear upon you, or they would go from the top of your head to the sole of your feet if you were a priest, or if you were a king, or if you were a prophet, but it had to be a prophet who came to someone God initiated and then they would pour out upon them. But what that symbol is supposed to be to us is that what happened in picture in the Old Testament through action was supposed to give us an indication of what happens in our life internally. So you have now been called, according to the book of Peter, you have been called a royal priesthood. In other words, you are both king and priest. You are carrying both the anointing of a king and you're carrying the anointing of a priest. See, in the Old Testament, they were two different people. You were either a priest or you were a king. They both carried weight in the Old Testament. They were both important characters in the Old Testament, but they did not interact with each other as far as working out each other's giftings. They were separate. But in the New Testament, the Bible says that, that the anointing of God was so strong and so good to us that he no longer looked and said, you can only have a small piece of me. You can only handle the little bit of me. You can only handle a little bit of that and a little bit of this. He said, no, 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 no. I have so much done something for you through the cross and the resurrection that I have made something capacity happen in you. And as a result of that capacity, I now can anoint you not just to be one thing, 
but to be all things. Now that's good news for you and I because it means that we are royal every day. That's why you need to not, you know, I see people all the time who now believe it's something cool to say, I'm a queen, I'm a queen. I'm, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? That is in the New Testament. That's been happening since Jesus got up. That is not some 21st century social media post. I've been a queen because the book of 2 Peter tells me I have already been royal. I didn't get royal because I hold a whole bunch of friends tell me how good I was. I didn't get royal because I wore the right outfit. I didn't get royal because I finally figured out who I was. I was royal because the resurrection of Jesus called me royal. And as a result of being royal, he said, you know what? It's not even good enough for me just to give you royalty. Because if I give you just royalty, you will wonder whether or not you can come boldly into the throne room of grace. And I don't want you to feel like you got to go through someone else to get to me. So I'm not going to just make you capable of sitting at my table because you're a queen or a king or a son or a daughter of mine. I'm going to also give you an anointing to where you can boldly. Come in with me, sit at my table, and believe you belong. I'm not going to withhold revelation from you. I'm not going to get held up on whether or not I can give you all of the Bible, and you can only get the New Testament, you can only get Isaiah, you can only get Jeremiah. No, no, no. He said, I'm not doing any of that. I've wiped away the conditions of the Old Testament, and I've anointed you to be both. And you say, well, what does that mean and what does that look like? I'm going to give you four things very quickly about what it means to be anointed. Is this okay? What the anointing does in your life. Because here's what the word creo means. It's C-H-R-I-O. If you had your Bible in Luke chapter 4, you should make a little note right there over the word anointed. That word is creo. That word is important to us because it is the root word for where we get Christ. It is the root word for where we get Christian. Did you know as long as you're calling yourself a Christian, you've been telling people you were anointed? Because Christ means the anointed, and Christians mean the anointed ones. So you've been walking around saying something you probably hadn't even understood. But the Bible says that the word creo is important to us because it doesn't just represent anointing of Christ. It is a word that means something has to be smeared on you. Now this is where it gets really good because I love how we just cannot handle sometimes messy church. Yet the very nature of Christ said who I am is I come and I smear stuff all over you. I bring the Holy Ghost and I just get you good and bring you over next to me and I just rub you down. Can you imagine if we didn't have a washing of the feet, but we had anointing services like that? Well, come on, let's just wash them down. But the word creo means to have a smearing upon you. This word actually comes from a different place than just from the Old Testament or from the New Testament in this particular case. It is a word associated with a shepherd. We still use this word today. It means that a shepherd who is keeping sheep wants to protect his sheep. And here's what we learn about sheep. Sheep have to be cared for. They are one of the only animals on the planet that do not have the capacity to care for themselves. Go look it up. This is all true. But a sheep has to have a shepherd. You can have a dog that can maybe make it on the side of the road. You can have a cat that might can go from house to house. You can have a cow that might make it as long as they've got some grass. But a sheep cannot survive without a shepherd because it cannot take off its own wool and it cannot actually defend its face. It has no ability to defend its face. So what a shepherd would do is he would come along in season, particularly in the summer months, when all of the flies are out, and he would come and he would smear an oil upon the face of the sheep to keep out the flies from entering into their nose. Because a fly that gets into an animal's nose will begin to set up shop in their brain and cause them to go mad. And a shepherd learned that if I keep the sheep saturated in oil, 
I keep their breathing in the right direction and free of any foreign objects. So Jesus comes along and he says, and he repeats Isaiah 61, where this principle would have been well known because there were many shepherds. He comes along in Luke chapter 4 and says, that's not an Old Testament concept. That is exactly what the Holy Spirit has done in me. And then Paul comes along and says, that same concept that was done in me by the Holy Ghost is now coming to you. So the first thing that happens when the Holy Spirit brings the anointing on our life is he protects us. He protects us. He causes a protection to come when the oil is applied. Now see, I know a lot of Christians who do a lot of good things in life. They are out there doing social good things. I mean, they, are, they got more websites, more things going on. They are just changing the world. Problem. The problem is, is that they have no anointing operating in their life, and you can tell because their life is full of anxiety, their life is full of worry, they don't know how to manage their money, their relationships are falling apart, them and their spouse don't have any relationship at all, their kids don't even want to be in church anymore, don't even want to associate with God. You say, well, they don't control that. Well, actually, the Bible says that when the anointing gets on the inside of your life and it is operating in purity, it has a protection that it brings to you. Is this okay? Y'all okay? Go with me to 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. 1 John chapter 2. And I'm going to just pick up on that. This Do you have this scripture in the back? 1 John 2, verse 20. There it is. But you, now this is now John. What I need to tell you about all 19 verses ahead is he's basically saying to the people, listen to me. You keep getting held up by all the false teachers. You keep getting held up by everybody that wants to tell you how to do stuff. They want to tell you, you got to wear this, you got to dress like that, you got to do this before me. And he said, I'm writing to you because I finally want to give you some good news. You have an anointing. And from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now, this was his point. His point was, is that you won't get held up with false teaching because you've learned to protect yourself with the anointing. You don't try to smear your own life. You don't go and tell God how to take care of you, but you have gone and yielded yourself to the care of a shepherd, and as a result of doing that, you absolutely know all things. Did you know that a sheep knows all things if they have a good shepherd? Because they don't have to know anything beyond what the sheep leads them to. Isn't that good news? Some of us are trying to figure out in our next step, and God's like, you know what? If you trusted me, I could actually lead you where you want to go. But instead, you want me to define everything. You want me to tell you everything. But people who are really anointed understand that my anointing protects them. Psalm 23 says something very interesting. It is the psalm of a shepherd. It is the very psalm in which David uses to demonstrate the shepherd relationship of Christ with mankind. And he says, when he talks about sitting in the presence of his enemies, his very next statement is, I don't just sit in the presence of my enemies, but you've anointed my head with oil. Let me go ahead and make a connection for you. The connection is, is that as long as you're living under the smear of the anointing, you can sit with people that don't like you all day long. Because where you think that you need protection, the Bible says it already showed up for you. Because the anointing protects you. It gives you that head reality that you have something. You know what I love about sheep? That it happens right here. You can't deny you just dripping with oil. The second thing that happens with a shepherd is they don't only put on the oil to keep the flies out. They put the oil on to stop the rams from fighting with each other. Now I'm just going to sit. The Bible said that, that you don't only become anointed to keep you away from enemies. Your anointing 
protects you from getting in trouble and against other people in your fold. When you're anointed, you're not looking for a fight. Only people who haven't learned how to carry the protection of the spirit are looking for a fight. Looking for a way to one-up somebody else. Needing to find a way to make sure that they feel like the little guy. But the reality is, is that a shepherd leads you by still waters. And his still waters means that you don't have to look for a fight to become who you are. You don't have to try to tell everybody all the things you got good for your life in order to be recognized for where you can be. The Bible is very clear that he anoints our head because it doesn't only protect us from our enemies, it protects us from killing each other. It protects us from the enemy from within. The second thing it does is the anointing comes and it enlarges us. The anointing comes to enlarge you. Now, I love this one. I'm probably going to sit on it for at least a couple minutes. Turn with, you got to turn here. Isaiah chapter 10. You know why you got to turn here? Because some of y'all need to mark this scripture. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed. Why? Because of the anointing oil. Now this scripture is written to an enemy called the Assyrians. It is the word of the Lord to Isaiah about the people of Judah. And he is telling them that they've been coming and getting after you for too long. I'm not going to let them keep getting the better of you because that's what the Syrians like to do. They like to come and take advantage. And he said, I'm not going to let them come and take advantage anymore. I'm not going to let their yoke of advantage keep getting at you. I'm going to break that yoke. But how did he say he's going to do it? I'm going to break that yoke by the anointing. The word anointing there is not creo. It's shemen, S-H-E-M-E-N. That word does not mean to smear. That word means to get fat. <coughs> Could you grab me water, please? Thank you. He said, I'm going to use your enlargement to break the yoke. Thank you, sir. To break the yoke that has been keeping you small. That word means fatness. And this is what I came to tell you today. Some of you are living under a yoke. And the reason you're still living under it, your yoke means that there's something on you trying to direct your life away from the course that God has you on. That's what yokes do. They keep you in some kind of form to do what it is it's assigned to do. In other words, your two yoke of oxen in the Old Testament would have been put together to plow a field. And the reason they were put together and yoked together is because there was one direction the farmer wanted you to go. And he wanted you to stay in alignment. And so therefore a yoke was using, used to make sure you stayed in alignment with whatever it is the farmer wanted. But the Bible says that where comes a time that the yoke of the enemy, I'm tired of the yoke of the enemy getting the advantage over your life. In other words, I'm sick of you coming to church and still going home on Monday to Saturday, not having any victory in your life, not having any overcoming in your life, not working through the issues with, with anything other than shame. I'm tired of the enemy's yoke on you, so what I'm going to teach you how to do is understand the anointing in your life so that you will grow an enlargement from the inside out, and I will not have to remove the yoke. You will get so big, you break the yoke. Some of you are trying to keep friendships that are actual yokes. And God keeps trying to grow you past them. And you keep wondering why you can't get a call from them and why they don't answer. Because they are yokes in a direction that is not for you. But the Bible says that what you need to do to break the yoke is not pray more, not have more Bible study, not figure out how many places you can serve. Not that that's all wrong. 
He said, that's not though what breaks the yoke. What breaks the yoke is when you learn how to get fat in me. And I bring the Holy Spirit to you so you learn how to enlarge yourself. It is the Isaiah 54 principle. Sing, O barren woman. Enlarge your tent because I'm about to bring to you everything you've been missing. And if you will make room for me, it will break off of you all the containment because you got so big it could no longer contain you. Some of you need to switch jobs probably because you have gotten out to a place that you cannot grow any further. You're in relationships with friends that you can't go any further. And as a result of it, you have become yoked in a direction that you will always have to walk. But the Holy Spirit wants you to know today that he can bring a shaman oil upon your life that will break the yoke because you get fat. He's interested in enlarging you. Do you know what he's interested in doing over Coventry? Here's the good secret. He's not trying to figure out how to get rid of drugs. This is, oh, I know. I got all your attention. Do you know why? Because drugs go when people get fat with anointing. Yokes go when people get fat with anointing. Stop praying for a result over here and living skinny. Eating 500 calories. Barely reading your Bible. Barely getting into the Word. Not understanding what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life. Not speaking in tongues on a regular basis. Stop living skinny expecting only what fatness can bring. God is trying to enlarge us But because by enlarging us, he changes that. It breaks the yoke. Here's the third one. When the anointing gets involved in your life, it enables you to function. Now, I love this because I'm going back to Luke chapter 4. When Jesus said of himself, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He gives you the first thing that he wants you to know. I'm not doing this just with me. Even Jesus wanted you to know that. I'm not doing this. I am God, but I want to be a demonstrator to you. I am doing this with the spirit of the Lord that is upon me. It's not upon my brother or my sister. It's upon me. I don't have to worry about whether or not it's upon them. What I'm worrying about is it's upon me. And this is what he said. He has anointed me to, to, the anointing comes to enable movement in you. People who are stuck, listen to me, if you're feeling stuck, what you need is not a list of good, bad, and ugly of all the things you want or you need to have moved. What you need is to get a revelation about the anointing. I have never pressed down a door in my life. I have never sent a business card to go preach anywhere in my life. Do you know why God has given me the privilege of traveling around the world? It is because I understood the enablement that comes when I tap into the anointing. Exodus chapter 31. You can just make a note for it so you can go back. Exodus chapter 31 gives us an example that it's not just connected to fivefold ministry. The Bible says that there was a man by the name of Bezel. Bezel was a man who was a craftsman. He could do many crafts. He was good at woodworking. He could create things out of wood. He could create things in in buildings. And the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Moses and said, I have anointed Bezel to work. My God. I've anointed him to build. I've anointed him to paint. I've anointed him to create. I've anointed him to make. This is all in Exodus 31. He said, I've put my spirit in him for this reason. 
I've come to tell you today, wherever God has assigned you in your work, whatever it is you're doing, if you're answering the phone on Monday, if you're typing something up on Tuesday, if you're standing up for as a CEO on Wednesday, if you're in boardrooms on Thursday, it doesn't matter where you're at. The Bible says, according to Exodus 31, that there is an enablement called the anointing that belongs to you. So wherever you are at, you are doing it with a better outcome than anybody around you, not because you are better, but because you are anointed. Your work looks better, not because you are that gifted. You're not that smart. You are seeing the results of working with the anointing. He comes and enables you to do things that you're incapable of doing at the level of excellence he desires. Do you know what I have learned? I have learned that the most distincting factor of a Christian in the work world is that they carry an excellence to finish things well. And when someone finishes something well, people take notice. The Bible in Exodus 31 says that these men, particularly him, was anointed to finish and to perform with excellence. I'm telling you, some of you, if you will take this revelation back to work tomorrow, your life will change. You will stop seeing this in drudgery and as if something's going to just take you down and you're never going to be able to know, my God, i got to answer the phone again. And you'll begin to see that my answering of my phone, me walking the streets, me picking up the towels in the bathroom, me doing all of these different things, I have been anointed. I am, an, I am anointed to be a mom. I am anointed to be a dad. I am anointed to be a business owner. I am anointed to be a businessman or businesswoman. I am anointed to be a teacher. I am anointed to solve problems. I am anointed to paint. I am anointed to prepare. I am anointed to say yes. I am anointed. And as a result of that anointing, I have an empowerment that comes. Isn't that good news? God wants to bring us an enablement. And the fourth one is this. Come on, because I know i got to round the corner. The fourth one is this. The anointing resides in our life to consecrate us to consecrate us. Now this is a, a word we don't tend to use anymore. The word consecrate means to be set apart, to not be like everyone else, to be different, to be holy, to not, to not just give in because everybody around you is doing it. The anointing comes to consecrate you and I. The book of Exodus, chapter 29, you can make a note of it, for verses 7 and 9. This is the first time that we see the anointing oil being used on humanity, really. And the Bible says that this direction came specifically from God himself. That God himself told Moses, this is what you're to do. You're to bring the priests before you. And when they get before you, he said, it's going to be Aaron and his sons. So let me tell you the first thing that God always works with in the anointing. He works generationally. Don't discredit what you live to walk in and work in in your home. You can't make a relationship for your kids, but you better believe you can lead them to water. I can teach them to be thirsty by observing my life. You can't make them drink, but you can make them thirsty. And I've learned that when the anointing gets into the consecration of my life, what comes out first is my humility. Where I don't believe I know it. The Bible says that when Aaron came, the word of the Lord to Moses was, Moses, tell Aaron I'm going to anoint him and all of his sons after. In other words, this isn't a one-time thing. This is for everybody that follows it. 
Isn't that good news? Because that means that God's working through us into anybody that wants it. Every generation. You can have a 10-year-old that can learn how to walk in the anointing. Do not despise your children's ages. Listen to me. Do not despise your grandchildren's ages. The sooner you recognize what's in them, the better parent you'll be. I don't parent my children the same way. I'm going to give you just a two-minute side note. I don't do that not because I'm not the same person. There are principles that remain the same in my family. But my children carry different gifts. And I have helped to shape those gifts by calling them out of them and developing them, not just as I want to talk to all my kids. I talk to my kids specifically depending on how it is they're gifted. The anointing's for all. But I draw out of my children by recognizing the gift of God in their life. So he said, bring your sons. But then he said this, start at the head and pour. Now hear me. When you become a consecrated man or woman, just a second. Do you mind Becky helping me? You're going to we're going to illustrate something. But I need a female because what I'm about to do, a female can only do with me. You okay? He said to Aaron, he said, pour on Aaron from the head to his feet. The anointing oil. The word is creo. But this is what it meant in Exodus 29. He said, and then, like a massage therapist, begin to work it in. Where there's sore muscle, work it out. Don't do it barehanded. Use the anointing. Say, Becky, I'm doing something in you. I know it feels rough out there. I know you're sore. I know you feel like you've been doing life. I know they left. I know that you lost the job. I know there's nothing in the account. I know there's nothing around you. But from the top of your head to the sole of your feet, I'm going to teach you how to receive the rub of the Holy Spirit so that I can rub into everything I have for you. Listen to me. Consecration is not about a dumping. Because God's not wasteful. It's not about more oil. It's about oil that gets rubbed in to you. So the Holy Spirit will take his time with his priesthood to be sure that he can rub into you. afraid to move because you've been discouraged when you moved them last. You're afraid to try some things because last time you did, it didn't work. Or it didn't go as you thought. You're afraid to jump into a relationship that God's really brought to you because everything in you is hesitant to believe and trust at that level. The Bible says when his anointing gets in us it can 
bring us to a place of healing, not by just soothing us, but by consecrating our heart, bringing us back to the reality that you are all our one. There's not another person on the planet in heaven or below that could do for me what one touch of your fresh oil can do.